Um, all those of you who know me know I don't really need this. Uh, the only reason we have this is because we are recording this uh, discussion so that perhaps somebody who can't attend would be able to catch it on the web and so on. For the same reason, we actually have a microphone out in the middle aisle, so if you have questions, it would be cool uh, when we get to the discussion, broader discussion section, if you would come out and you know, use, get in line, use the, use the microphone. Much appreciate that. Uh, my name is Joe White. I direct the Center for Policy Studies. I'm a professor of political science here at Case Western Reserve University. And uh, this is our program on, uh, on whether rationing is needed as part of health care reform. Uh, this program is sponsored by the Center for Policy Studies. It does not represent the opinions of anybody in particular other than the participants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, however, I, was, uh, I, I uh, should admit that uh, I thought it would be a good idea to have this program because I have opinions on the topic. Uh, and I thought it would be particularly good to gather uh, as colleagues uh, the extremely distinguished health policy scholars from the School of Medicine and Nursing, and God knows where else he's from in the case of uh, Professor Robert Binstock, and the School of Management uh, with appointments in other places too in the case of Professor J.B. Silvers. Uh, we have some really superb uh, health policy scholars in this university. Um, I see Professor Melman at the back. Um, there, there are many really fine scholars here, and it's particularly, it's always good to appear on a panel and bask in their reflected uh, glory. Um, I actually put at the back of the, uh, of the uh, room uh, a copy of a blog post by me and a response by Dan Brock. I did not provide the original post by Dan Brock, which set me off, led to my blog post, and led to my wanting to do this program. Uh, but the issue that is floating out there is you will see continual claims in the health policy literature and in the press that if we want to get serious about cost control, we must confront the need to ration care. Um, and the implication is that if you do not approve of the need to ration care, then you are not a serious person and you are in some form ethically lax in that you are not considering the real moral issues that must be addressed. And my personal position is that is nonsense at a series of levels. Um, and what I address in the blog point, is, in the blog post, uh, is a simple, pose a simple case that I think an, a bioethicist of this flavor would come up with. Uh, and the simple case is imagine someone took you into the woods with three other people, a child of 10 years old with no particularly distinguishing characteristics, a 75-year-old Nobel Prize winner, um, and a 40-year-old uh, drunk with a family. And then they handed you a gun and said, you have to kill one of these people or we'll go back and kill your family. And uh, these bioethicists could go into a tremendously complex discussion of, uh, well, it's a Nobel Prize winner, a good guy, but he's not going to contribute much for the rest of his life, and he's 75 years old, he's had a good life, and the kid, we don't have any reason to expect anything of the kid, but, you know, there's 75 quality adjusted life years to go maybe or something. And the drunkard, yeah, he's a drunkard, but there's all these people depending on him, maybe he'll straighten out. You know, they did all these wonderful ethical arguments and, and miss the obvious thing, which is you take the gun, you shoot the guy who handed you the gun, and you all go home. And, and the reason that's relevant is that the argument that's continually made is that we have these immense costs in our health care system. And because of that, we have to ration. Um, and yet, if you think of the analogy, who's handing us the gun? The health care system's handing us the gun. Um, we spend, in the United States, about 17% of gross domestic product on health care. Um, any other advanced industrial democracy spends 11 or less, provides, as far as we can figure out, um, you know, pretty darn good care, with access with insurance for virtually everybody. You've got to figure that we could get to 13% instead of 17, cover everybody, provide all those services all those other countries are, and not really have to ration. I'm not talking about the United Kingdom where people claim there's rationing down there at you know, 8 or 9% of GDP. I'm talking about countries like Germany and France where there's no waiting list that anybody can determine you know, and, and where they spend a lot less than we do while covering everybody. And so one of the things, so to me, you know, as a scholar of cost control, you know, first basic rule, costs are income. 
And the most fundamental potential, at least, ethical conflict in our system is not among patients, between pa but between the people who need care and the people who make money off it, which isn't just physicians by any means. It's the drug companies, it's the hospital administrators, it's the insurance companies, and so on. And to me, to say we have to focus on choosing among patients is essentially to, to accept whatever ethical challenges exist uh, in the behavior of all the people who are making money out of the, off the system. And that strikes me as a very narrow version of ethics. Now, Dan Block's answer in his response is, well, I agree with you, but we can't do anything politically about controlling the incomes, and so we have to you know, deal with you know, rationing, which is an absurd argument if you follow the health care debate at all. Yes, doing anything about incomes, for instance, regulating prices, is very hard. But in case you haven't noticed, the argument that health care reform means rationing is the master argument against health care reform by the opponents. Um, if you couldn't see it, if you haven't been following the debate, there was a very nice uh, piece by Frank Luntz, the well-known conservative Republican pollster, uh, advising Republicans about how to beat health care reform back in like February, which said this exactly. So the idea that Dan Brock's giving me political advice about, you know, that, that, that this is really a political argument. Well, if it's a political argument, please, Dan, stay away. It's not your field. Um, now, having said that, where does this come from? And it comes from a couple of places. One is data that has been pointed out for years that a substantial portion of Medicare costs are, in fact, incurred on treatment of people who are, in fact, at the end of life. And, uh, and people who treat patients at the end of life often feel that this care is unnecessary, that they're sticking people full of tubes and so on, and that in some cases people do not want, in fact, to be receiving that treatment, and that it is unnecessary. So there is a moral argument based on certain experiences that some caregivers and advocates see in care at the end of life for some people. And that gets conflated. So the idea that this is, in some sense, bad care anyway, gets conflated with the idea that it's also, boy, it's a lot of money. Now, separate from the argument that this is bad care anyway, there's something wrong with the argument that this is a main driver of health care costs. And what's wrong with the argument that it's a main driver of health care costs is that care at the end of life has been the same proportion of Medicare or slightly falling for the last 40 years. Sorry since 1971 when they started doing the data. Um, it's about 25% or slightly more of total Medicare costs and has been all along. Now, sorry, correction. They stopped doing the studies after about 2,000 data because it was so darn standard. People have been making the end-of-life argument since, you know, the 1970s. Uh, but the fact is, care at the end of life has not been growing and has probably been shrinking as a share of Medicare spending. And if that's true, how can we say it's a driver of costs? It's a component of costs, but it can't be a driver of costs because all other costs are going up just as fast. Uh, so, so as an explanation of costs, it just doesn't work. Now, there is the question of whether uh, people might want different care at the end of their lives. And some people might. And that's why having discussions about advanced directives and so on is a good idea. Uh, but the whole idea that this is a driver of costs and that therefore what we need to do to control costs is reduce care at the end of life is just not based on the data. And, it's not, and the data has been clear at least since the Lubitz and Riley study in 1993. The second thing is there, it is true that there is, there appears to be, some unnecessary care going on. So if the question is, not just for people at the end of life, but in general, could spending be reduced if only the right care was delivered to the right person at the right time by the right provider in the right place? And the answer is probably, although there is also a substantial amount of data that says that people do not get the care that they, that, that there's a lot of care that people should get, even if they're insured, that they don't get. And so you have these sort of 
They're not dueling studies. People endorse both positions and then they just assume the numbers come out somehow as we, do, we have too much care rather than too little. I mean, the, the, the studies that we have, that some people don't get the care they should, don't you know, really get contradicted. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that there's probably some unnecessary utilization. And if somebody can figure out how to avoid that, I'd be very glad to hear about it. Uh, I can tell you as a policy analyst, it's a lot easier to address prices uh, than to try to control the actual practice by individual physicians. I can affect their prices very easily. All I have to do is say, I run the payment system, we're just going to pay so much for the following diagnosis. I can't affect the diagnoses very well. Um, and so the record of cost control around the world, both in the United States and in other countries, is that while price regulation or competitive forces to drive down costs are imperfect, they work a whole lot better than most other things. And most, of the, and most of the explanation of systems that have lower costs is they pay lower prices. And I have, and uh, my colleagues and I have pieces in uh, uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine and Health Affairs and New England Journal of Medicine about this this year. And I can also put, and, and the, particularly the most recent ones in the New England Journal and in Health Affairs, which came out in the last 10 days, have sites to website postings about some of, the, some of the data and analysis here. And it's also on the Center for Policy Studies website. Now, I'm not saying there are easy answers. But I am saying that if you're going to focus on cost control, it would be nice if we talked about prices more and about the need to cut off care to the people at the end of life a whole lot less. Um, with that, I would like to turn over uh, the, for the microphone to Professor Binstock. I will would like to also acknowledge that there was a speech last night. <laughs> um, and it's possible that people might have questions about something other than the exact topic of today's forum. And it's possible that Professor Binstock and Professor Silvers and I could attempt to address some of those other issues as well. With that, Professor Binstock. That was terrific, Joe. Uh, it's tough to follow uh, someone who's one of the best uh, experts on this in the country, but I'll give it a try. I'm surprised when you mention I have other appointments. Well, I shouldn't be surprised. You didn't mention political science. Maybe you wanted to disown me, just in case. <laughs> I just didn't have time. Right. <laughs> uh, so the focus of my remarks uh, this afternoon will be on the subject of rationing the health care of older persons. Uh, we know there are no bureaucratic death panels as Sarah Palin and others have suggested. But in truth, uh, I think seniors and near seniors should be concerned because there's a growing movement of Washington Beltway folks and other policy wonks and healthcare professionals who focus in on cutting back care for older persons. And the prime reason for this, of course, is that most people 65 and older have national health insurance through Medicare. Its expenses are increasing every year. It covers most uh, of all of those people. And the number of older people is doubling from 35 million at, in the year 2000 to 70 million uh, just 20 years from now. Uh, that's when, of course, all of the baby boomers will have entered the ranks of old age. So one in five Americans will be 65 and older. And even though Medicare is not responsible for health care cost increases, the focus is there because it is the easiest part to control because it's a unified government payment system. Okay. So, for example, think of uh, diagnostic related groups which were introduced in the 1980s as doing as uh, Joe suggested giving a fixed price per diagnosis no matter how long or how short you stayed in the hospital. That not only reduced the length of stay for Medicare patients but it also led the private insurance companies to say hey you know why are you charging us this and keeping these patients in so long if Medicare 
pays this, and the hospitals certainly accept that. So it had an overall impact in costs in the system. Now, let me give you an example of the current movement to curtail care for older persons. The National Academy of Sciences recently established a panel this year on the grand challenges of our aging society. And at our first meeting, a prominent geriatrician almost immediately said, well, older people get a disproportionate share of our health care costs. And I said, you mean disproportionate in relation to their size in the population, their percentage? Or do you mean disproportionate in relation to their need for health care? And he sort of gave me a blank look and I said, suppose I gave you an analogy, let's say I'm making up the figure, 18 percent uh, of our population is school children. Would you believe we spend nearly 100 percent of our school funds on them? Okay. Uh, so then we had a symposium at the academy and he uh, made a presentation on we do too much stuff. I'm a geriatrician and I know we do too much stuff for older people. There are many cliched but inaccurate lines from so -called, the so-called health care cognizanti. Uh, I heard one the other day. Population aging is the single biggest source of health care cost increases. Wrong. Okay. Uh, most health economists, for example, David Cutler of Harvard or Stuart Altman of Brandeis, place uh, the contribution of population aging to the increases in health care costs is no more than about 10 percent. Moreover, cross-national studies uh, indicate this isn't the case. I did one some years ago uh, comparing the percentage of GDP spent on health care and the proportion of people who were old in the various countries. These were Japan, Germany, Norway, Sweden, France, you know, the usual suspects. Uh, and what I found was that even if you looked at it in terms of the increase in the proportion, let alone the, what the proportion was, there was absolutely no association. So, for example, there were countries over a 10-year period where the proportion of aged people went up, and guess what? Their percentage spent on health care went down. Okay. Uwe Reinhardt repeated this, a uh, famous economist at Princeton, uh, about five years ago and found basically the same thing. So uh, it's, it's not that population aging is the big driver of health care costs. It's inflation in the overall uh, sector. And in particular, as Cutler has uh, pointed out most uh, pointedly, uh, the introduction of new procedures, new equipment, and we don't stop using the old stuff when, when we put in the new stuff. So just think of non-invasive imaging over the years, x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, PET scans, and all of them are still very much in use. Okay. Uh, another one, um, well, let me make a, a broader point on this. The costs of health care for a system have to do with the structural features of the system. So as in Britain, if you have a fixed budget or an an HMO, you have a fixed budget, uh, you know, that's going to very much damp down how much you spend. We have open-ended budgets for health care here. So uh, if you have fee-for-service, for example, uh, the more services, the more money the providers and suppliers and so on make. Uh, in an HMO, the incentive is to underserve. Moving on, um, another cliche is overuse of intensive feudal high cost treatments for the elderly. Point Joe made, uh, very much distorted. One of the distortions in this, I'll just briefly mention, is that there are 5,000 people 65 and older who die every day in this country. The vast, vast majority of them are low-cost cases. They die in nursing homes. They die at home. 
uh, they die. A DOA, when the ambulance brings you to the emergency room, there's a Medicare bill attached to it. So what I'm saying is that dying among people 65 and older is a very high volume activity, but <laughs> much of it takes place at a very low cost. Okay. Uh, the work of Berkeley economist Ann Skotovsky some years back found that among the high cost cases of persons aged 65 and older, half live and half die. And it's difficult to know ahead of time which those are going, which are going to be in which group. Uh, there have been uh, studies by the support group which have gone into predicting, having physicians predict uh, or who's going to die and how soon. And except for certain types of cancers, the, the truth is that those prognoses are very, very inaccurate. Uh, this is well-published data. The exceptions, of course, are these cancers. For example, uh, Senator Kennedy's uh, recent brain tumor, you know, the average, li well, the life expectancy is for that is about 18 months, generally speaking, uh, and often much less. Now, I had a uh, coronary artery bypass graft operation in 2001 when I was 65 years of age. I like to think I've made a lot of good contributions since then to my students and elsewhere, and I hope to keep on uh, doing this. Nonetheless, the movement to cut back on care for older persons under Medicare has had an effect. So in 2005, the Congressional Budget Office, one of the bureaucracies established by Congress, had conducted a study of, quote, high-cost Medicare beneficiaries and uh, try to identify and did, you know, who they are. And it concluded the report by saying, so the next step is what to do about this. This is a harbinger of the movement. Uh, there's been a furor regarding one of the present health care reform bills because it provides doctors with reimbursement for uh, optional consultations regarding end of life. Uh, in fact, uh, a similar provision already exists, and it's amazing that it's never come up in this discussion of the death panel and pulling the plug and so on. Medicare covers a comprehensive physical, which they call welcome to Medicare, within the first 12 months of your uh, joining the program. And as of January 1 this year, it is mandatory, the word is required, that that exam include end-of-life planning discussions. Okay. Uh, this is uh, an interesting question. Why did this requirement get legislated if there's not a movement to cut down on health care for older persons at what appears to be the end of life? Now, the truth is we've had a Federal Patient Self-Determination Act for almost 20 years, which requires hospitals and nursing homes uh, to ask you as you're admitted, do you have any sort of an advanced directive? That is to say a living will, or have you given somebody your durable uh, power of attorney? Uh, it's not been overly successful, uh, both in terms of getting people to sign up who haven't, uh, or in terms of getting physicians to follow the living wells uh, if there is one, okay? Uh, so not achieving uh, the results that the proponents wanted. So now we have mandatory end-of-life counseling if you want a comprehensive exam from your doctor in the year you enter the program. As I said, it's amazing this hasn't figured in uh, to any of the current discussions. I'm not particularly wise about this. I only discovered it two days ago. Okay, uh, on the Medicare website. So let me conclude uh, by tracing the seeds of this current movement to limit care for older persons and the movement's implications as I see them. Actually, I trace back uh, this movement to a speech that Alan Greenspan, the immediate past uh, head of the Federal Reserve, gave in 1983 to the Health Insurance Association of America. 
And what he said was, he overstated it. He said something like 33% of Medicare is spent on people in the last month. It's, as Joe said, it's about 27% and been very consistent. Anyway, he said, is it worth it? Okay, he asked rhetorically and obviously to the health insurance uh, audience, uh, the uh, answer was very clear. Uh, that was followed the next year in 1984 by the governor of Colorado, Richard Lamb, who was widely quoted as saying older people have a duty to die and get out of the way and make humus for the growth and development of younger people. Okay. Uh, the next day he said he was misquoted, but the truth is he's been <laughs> writing and saying the same thing ever since in somewhat more diplomatic forms. Then we had uh, a philosopher named Norman Daniels who wrote a book, Am I My Parents Keeper? And uh, basically the answer was no. Uh, I won't get into uh, the length of it at this time. Uh, there was a conference held shortly afterward, uh, Should Health Care Be Rationed by Age? As an explicit title, book came out of that. Uh, but perhaps the most notable uh, uh, proponent of this uh, is a uh, bioethicist named Dan Callahan who wrote a book in 1987 called Setting Limits, Medical Goals in an Aging Society, in which he proposed that no one in their late 70s or older should be given life-extending care. Notice life-extending. I don't know the difference from that and, and, and life-saving, except it implies you're getting something extra if you're <laughs> extending it. Okay. In any event, uh, that was his uh, proposal. Uh, there's a grand irony that Dan, who is now age 79, recently had a seven-hour heart operation. <laughs> I sent him an email uh, wishing him a speedy recovery and many years of quality life. And I haven't heard back. Who <laughs> paid for it? Medicare, I believe. No doubt Medicare. Well, he still might have health insurance through the Hastings Center. I don't know. He's working there. Finally, I'd like to point up what bioethicists call the slippery slope that could be involved in rationing health care of older persons. Why I think it poses a threat to our society, not just to some older people. Okay. Uh, I debated Dan Callahan uh, after his book came out some years ago, and it was a dreadful format, uh, an hour and a half of him, an hour and a half of me, no break, and then lunch and we were coming back. So I thought I'd wake him up for lunch, as I concluded. And I said, do you realize what this man is saying? He's saying that a group of us described demographically is unworthy of life-saving care. And then I really hammed it up. I said, what group will be next? Mentally disabled? The physically disabled? Gypsies? Blacks? Jews? Well, half this audience, you know, they were going, okay, mentally disabled. <laughs> and the other half was sort of, and I thought, this isn't just a, an abstract uh, issue. Uh, and in fact, uh, any of you who have seen the Holocaust's exhibit, uh, museum's exhibit on eugenics, uh, might find uh, something very striking there, which I learned, again, out of ignorance for the first time, that well before the rise of Hitler, the mentally disabled, the physically disabled, and others were being exterminated in gas ovens, eight, eight of them decentralized around the country. Okay? Uh, so talk about a slippery slope when you start in with one group not being worthy and the next etc. Uh, now, no one uh, other than Callahan has suggested a formal age cutoff, but we already have informally in practice racial disparities in youth, U.S. health care and disparities within the poorer segments of our population of all races. And as Joe suggested, we are the only advanced industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have universal health care coverage. We should be moving in the direction of inclusiveness, not looking for ways to limit the care of various groups of people, including the elderly. There are other ways to cut costs for our health care system. For instance, regulating private insurance companies 
their premium rates and other of their practices far more strongly than we do. And the same with pharmaceutical and medical equipment industries. We should treat them like private utility companies, which have long been strongly regulated under the well-established doctrine of businesses affected with a public interest. I can't think of a business more affected with the public interest than the business of health care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Binstock. Uh, now let's hear from Professor J.B. Silvers of the Weatherhead School of Management. Well, after the previous two speakers, I feel like I should be the one that should defend rationing since we've trashed it so much. But <laughs> I have trouble with that. I, I can't entirely do that. Um, I also was a little disturbed when Bob started going through that list of, of folks that might be rationed against since my wife often talks about that, that I actually work in a sheltered workshop for intellectuals here anyway. And <laughs> so we might be part of that that process as well. When I say that to my academic colleagues, they don't laugh usually. I thought that was just hilarious. Let me, um, when this little debate started on the internet, on the email, uh, my first reaction was, uh, to, to Joe's first points, were, was, was basically that rationing was not a helpful term. It didn't get us any place. So why would we want to use a term like that? But let me spend a little bit of time thinking about what rationing really means and I'll play the um, I'll play the the business school professor and play the economics side worried less about the regulatory issues and the policy questions that the previous two speakers and more about how would this actually happen if we did do rationing what's what's behind it rationing is really a meaningful term only when Supply and demand are out of sync someplace. Okay, I said it. Supply and demand. That's the economics involved here. That the, the concept is that supply doesn't e equal demand. And therefore, we don't have enough of this to go around and we've got to somehow allocate it. And the argument is, well, prices and markets do that anyway. That's really a mis, 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 uh, ter mis terminology because the question is, if if market and supplies, supply and demand are out of sync some, somehow or another, it's usually a short-term phenomenon. We have a spike in oil prices. We have a shortage due to a, an embargo. We have something like that. There's a short-term phenomenon that's going on. <clears throat> so the real question underlying the, what, the question of rationing, let me say, is three things. One is, why would it happen? Why would supply and demand be out of sync? in some way to create this necessary need to, to allocate this, this scarce resource to how quickly can it be corrected. So short term, long term. And, and secondly, what does it take to fix it? So if we're going to talk about rationing, I want to deal with those three elements that I think the question is, why did it happen, how, quick, how long term is it, how quickly can it be, can be taken care of, and, and what's, what do we have to do to fix it? And my bottom line is we're jumping to the wrong place in that sequence, and therefore we're coming up with some strange conclusions. Well, <clears throat> what's out of sync? It clearly, in my mind, is not capacity in the United States. We have more capacity than we know what, well, I should, shouldn't say than we know what to do with. We actually use it, which is part of the trouble. We, capacity is not a problem. It's got to be something about excess demand. So we're using, we, got, we have lots of capacity out there, but we have more demand somehow or another than, than, than we have if, if we do have a rationing situation. Ironically, it also, we don't seem to have any, any control over price because price seems to be wacky as we've talked about before. So the question then is, how can we have a market that's this strange, that's got these weird things going where we even lead to the question of, of rationing as, as part of the debate? Let me argue that the reason why, and I think this is fundamental, why things don't work the way they're supposed to is because <clears throat> we have a classic problem of what in economics or finance we would call agency. We hire agents to make decisions for us. It's an agency problem. We have two kinds of agents. We have a medical agent that we hire, the doc, 
uh, that that is all powerful, makes the decisions for us, diagnoses what's wrong, decides what needs to be done, and therefore then we act on it. Uh, and that agent tends to push access. We want more and more of things. And technology. I want it to be fancier, better, more intrusive. Now the question is why would that happen? We'll get to that in a second. So one is we've got, we got a medical agent pushing one direction. The second is we, they're opposed by physical agents. We've got other people who are trying to argue on our behalf or they're trying to argue about the physical side of the whole thing in the form of employers because 100 million people in the country are, have as their agent their employer. They have self-insured plans. So the whole argument about insurance is a little bit misleading because we have health plans that are basically employers paying hired guns to do things for them in terms of allocating their, their scarce resources in terms of buying health care. They're not insuring. They don't buy insurance. They buy health services. So that's a fundamentally different phenomenon. So when we talk about reforming the health insurance market, we've got to be a little bit careful because 100 million people are not in the health insurance market, more than 100 million people. So we have these two agents. The physical agent is, is largely the, 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 um, the uh, employer that hires hired guns for them in the form of, of insurance companies that manage care agents, and the government, which also tends to hire agents for them. The little known fact is that they're administered by largely by other agencies, Blue Cross plans, other commercial insurance companies. They're the ones that actually process claims. They're the ones that actually inter interact with the, with, the, uh, with the providers. There's no insurance company involved here. Um, and they're relatively ineffective. So the question is why are they relatively ineffective in terms of doing what we've hired them to do? So we have very powerful f medical agents relatively ineffective physical agents, neither one of them representing our needs as, as the recipients of this service. So what, what we have is a medical a market and choices that are based on the decisions of agents that we've hired that don't really do a very good job. They fail. And that kind of a market just doesn't work very well. So what I would argue is what we're seeing is the failure of the agents that we've hired. Now this sounds a little academic, so let me get it, get down to, to this. That will inevitably be the case when I have agents that are making them. Sometimes the agents that I hire that fail, don't do a very good job, the consequences are fairly minor. Uh, I hire an agent to take care of my car when I go in and they do sloppy work. Uh, I call up the internet company or I have a billing problem and I ask them to do something for me. They don't do a very good job. doesn't get fixed. I mean, we've all had those kind of agency issues. The, the, the agent just doesn't perform very well. The parallel in healthcare is quality. <clears throat> I hire somebody to do something for me and they don't do a very good job. The surgeon doesn't do timeout and does wrong site surgery. Uh, I get a misdiagnosis. The wristband isn't checked by the nurse and I get the wrong meds. Uh, one of my sidelight activities is I'm on the board of the Joint Commission that accredits uh, 15,000 healthcare organizations and it's sort of the arbiter in some ways of, of quality. There are enormous number of problems with quality. Quality is really not good. And the indicators that come out now show that in any number of ways. The core indicators of quality, the most recent one that made the news recently is, is a return to the hospital, readmissions. Uh, one out of five, one out of four uh, cases in terms of uh, heart failure, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, heart attacks, and pneumonia return to the hospital within 30 days. Now, this is a pretty easy indicator that says we're not doing a very good job. Okay, so I've hired agents. They aren't, very, they aren't reflecting my interest very well. Some, so sometimes they fail in terms of what I get. Sometimes they fail in terms of, of, of what it costs me. So I hire agents to go out and do bargaining for me, and they don't do a very good job. There, there's a lack of serious price negotiation, and that, that lack of price negotiation, is, it permeates not the Medicare market because Medicare gets pretty good rates. Medicare on average pays 90 to 95 percent of average cost. Medicaid pays about 80 percent of average cost. They underpay by, mo by most people's assessment. 
the, 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 the folks that I hire on the other side do a bad job by overpaying. They pay about 130% of cost. So the tough-minded guys that my employers hired to go out, including Case Western Reserve, I might add, to go out and bargain good deals for us don't do a very good deal. They don't do a very good job. Now, mea culpa, I ran one of these hired guns for a while. <laughs> we did our best to try to drive down price, and we did it by selective contracting and by, by leaving people out. I got personally, I have scars on my back from CVS because CVS would not give us the discounts that we needed for call choice in terms of what the other people would give us, and so I made the decision we're going to cut them out of the network. I got big TV cameras, my people calling me. They caved. We got lower prices. Why? Because we were willing to negotiate as a tough, as a tough-minded pair. We weren't able to dictate, but we were able to negotiate. So sometimes our physical agents don't do a very good job, and and they fail. My favorite one right now, and the place where most of the reform efforts I think are focused, is in the small group and individual market. Because if you look at those markets. They are complete market failures. In this case, the employer goes out and hires an agent for them. They're already hiring an agent, and that agent is usually a broker. The broker then negotiates with that physical agent, the insurance company, and then they help you select among them. What is little known is that the broker takes out of the premium stream as much as the primary care doc takes out of the premium stream. <laughs> Why? Well, it's a complete market failure because nobody knows what's going on. It's not transparent. So we have a problem of our physical agents not doing a very good job, so we don't get good price negotiation. Therefore, we have a market failure in, in terms of that. And sometimes that's very expensive, and I think that's the argument that, that Joe would make, that we haven't done a good job more on, I would argue, more in the private market than the public market. I, I would argue that, that, that the problem in the public market that is Medicare and Medicaid, is that we're paying for the wrong thing. We're paying for units of individual service rather than bundles of services or some other sorts of thing, which is part of the debate right now. Um, and sometimes the agent fails in terms of not, not the quality and not the price, but in terms of the volume. So I'm going out and I'm negotiating for you trying to do a good job negotiating, either as a government or as a private payer that's, that's going out and doing this. And sometimes I lead to excess purchasing. I buy too many. A uh, case outside of health care, why do we keep buying aircraft carriers and jets that by even the military standard we don't need? Okay. Well because we have a failure in that purchasing market. Sometimes we buy too much. And that, in this case, happens because the prices are set in a strange way on a unit basis. So I pay you more to do more images, therefore the examples that we had before are really easy to happen. So I've got a market failure of that agent who tries to buy too much of the wrong thing in, in, in the wrong place. So we've got a problem with, with this. In, in, in healthcare, the places show up, particularly in diagnostic images. So the diagnostic images that I buy are bought individually. I pay for them for piecework, and why should I be surprised when I do a whole lot of them? Because I've got everything pushing that way and almost nothing pushing back. To call that rationing is absolutely wrong. It's a market failure. It's not rationing. I've bought too much of the wrong thing with the wrong incentive. So I'd structured my market in a strange way. And that failure happens both on the private market, Case Western Reserve buying images, and it also happens on Medicare. Medicare buys too many images. So I've got a problem with this. To jump from a market failure because I structured this industry with these agents, these medical and physical agents, that don't represent my interest very well and don't do a good job and are acting more in their own interest or are ineffectual, to jump from that market failure to the conclusion that the only way to solve the problem is to ration care is nonsensical. It, 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 it leads to strange things. It's like saying I want to put a cap on the amount of auto repair that I'm going to do because the agents that I hire aren't doing a very good job. That doesn't make sense. You have to do the auto repair that needs to be done. You want to do it in a more intelligent way, 
but that's you don't put a cap on it. You don't ration it. Uh, the number of ships. I want to limit the number of ships. Well, no, I want to limit the number of ships. I want to buy the right ships. <laughs> you know, I would like to do it intelligently. So, the problem I would argue is that we don't we don't have good mechanisms to do that, and that's the that's the dilemma. Okay, now. The global policy framework is much easier to jump to where we've been before. Let's have a global budget. Let's put caps on things. Let's do other. Let's drive down the prices. Forget about the quantity because we can't control that. Just drive prices down. I would say that's a that is a second or third best solution. The real question is how can I change what I buy to be more intelligent about it? That's the real question. Now, how do we do that? Our best hope, it seems to me in this one, is to direct the care to the right providers who do a good job and provide value. So what I would argue is we're involved in a huge debate right now, sort of below the mark, below the radar, but it's still an important debate, to figure out who are the best providers. That's why Medicare puts all that Medicare compare stuff on the website to say, well, who does have larger readmission rates? Who does have better outcomes? Who is doing the right process stuff? And we're going to be moving that on down. The National Quality Forum has got 200 indicators sitting out there ready to go. We've got 30 of them now on the web. We'll have 70 of them within the next year. We're going to have a lot of data about who's good. Okay? We don't have much data about who's effective in terms of price, and that will be the next one. But then, then the question is, so I get data, what do I do with it? Well, if you're a Republican that believes in individual markets, we're all going to go and sort through that database and figure out which is the right place to go for my angioplasty or for my uh, coronary bypass surgery, and that's nonsense because we all know that's not going to happen. But what it will inform is the agents that I hire. Potentially, I can hire agents to do a better job. Now, let me give you an example of this. A colleague of mine I've had a lot of time discussing this with, Chuck Weller, has, uh, has argued for a number of years he was involved in the PPO of evolution. The PPOs, for those who don't sort of know that other than some sort of a terrorist organization, were, pre were preferred providers that exclusively contracted with one set of providers and not with another. And they, were, they evolved over a very short period of time, about five, six, seven years. And, you know, they grew very, very rapidly. They're now the dominant form of private purchasing, particularly among individual among companies that are buying for their own employees, self-insured employees. What they did was they used their market power to drive down prices, and they drove it down very dramatically. So the prices for PPOs were negotiating from providers were about 30 percent less than, than for, for people that were just wandering around the system. Okay? Now, that worked really well until people got mad and we had a managed care backlash and people didn't like a lot of things they were doing. They were pretty effective in using that purchasing power. The argument is, could we do the same thing again? Is there a way to direct care to providers that, in fact, have high quality, have good outcomes, and are effective in terms of the use of resources? The Geising, the ones that mentioned last night, the Intermountain Healthcare, Geisinger's integrated plans, things of that sort. The answer is yes. We haven't asked them to do it. They don't quite understand how to do it. But changing the way the agent makes the decision is an alternative to flipping over immediately to regulatory and payment processes at a global level. Now, I'm not so sure that we're going to be doing that. But I would argue that I think what we'll find is individual payers, that is, individual purchasers, employers, will have to think of mechanisms like that or they will walk away from this completely because it's unsustainable for most businesses to be able to continue to have the, 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 the aggregate cost increases per year, to have so much of your compensation taken in terms of health care costs and not as much in terms of, of cash compensation for the employees. The unions will agree with that too. And that could be the coalition that pushes us to where the folks on the left would like to go to a single payer system. That is a very possible outcome of this whole thing. Intermediate, since people still like to have choice and they still like to have employer-based insurance and we still have tax incentives that direction, is doing more intelligent purchasing. Now, I would argue neither one of those, that the latter, is, is not a reaction to rationing. It's a reaction to market failure and bad purchasing behavior 
and poor value received. So I think we're going to be in some interesting debates here in the next period of time. I don't think the rationing argument is anything more, in my view, than a political framework, and therefore where Joe started is, is the right place. If it is used as a bludgeon to defeat health care reform, that's what it is. It's not a real debate about rationing, and I don't think we're there at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Silvers. I'd now like to open up the discussion further. Um, if you can come and, and speak in the microphone, then we could record you. Uh, on the other hand, if you're sitting back there and you don't want to walk up there, Professor Melman, I will just repeat your question. <laughs> For the, but I know you've got a question. Okay, a comment. Okay. and it was entitled, I Had a Tough Day Today Too, Hillary. And it was <laughs> written by the medical director for CNA Insurance. And it described how he was uh, uh, having to make decisions uh, among about a dozen patients to decide who would get life-saving treatment and who wouldn't. And it's a, very, it's a very provocative piece. But what it demonstrates is that, you know, we have death panels now. They're called the medical directors of insurance companies. And we have rationing in the form of the decisions that are, are, are that happen below the radar um, because by and large he is not accountable for the decisions that he makes uh, there's no appeal um, and we also have rationing uh, at the bedside because if any of you are physicians I would bet you've heard a colleague say at some point why are we wasting resources on this person not because the resources won't provide net physiologic benefit, but because this person is fill in the blank and therefore not really worth it, racially, um, in terms of their jobs, homeless, whatever. So we have rationing now, and I think the, 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 it's unfortunate that the R word has become, as, as, as we've pointed out, used unfairly as a bludgeon. The issue, I think, is whether we want to continue to have rationing be like sausage making, do it, don't tell us, do it, you know, uh, don't tell us, don't let us know it's happening, or whether we want to bring it out into the open and make it a matter of public decision making. That seems to me to be, you know, a, a, an alternative approach. Well, I think I'll comment first, but I suspect the others will have thoughts. Um, one thing is that um, there's no question that there are sort of points within the healthcare system where there are limits on resources and where the question of whether uh, the use of resor or further resources is justified come up, or the question of on whom resources should be used come up. Um, and sometimes that uh, is, uh, I'll give you an example. I was at the hospital uh, when a friend was dying and she was going to continue bleeding. They couldn't stop the bleeding and should they stop? And the question came up of what, should they keep transfusing her. And I was with her husband when that decision had to be made. Um, so, and in any, you know, you have a bus accident <laughs> um, in, any, in any city, um, and there's going to be some prioritizing in the ER. So, and any system is going to have situations where there are going to be um, professional decisions, agency, some quote unquote rationing has to be made. The individual isn't choosing, she's unconscious. But that's very different from saying rationing is the answer. Rationing is what we don't do and must do more of. And it is a big difference between having formal processes where you try to, where you try to set rules and then say, well, if you don't follow the rules, you've done something wrong. And having more informal processes that could lead to discriminatory practices that you couldn't justify. It's like, well, that person doesn't speak so much good, such good English, so I don't know what they really want, so I'll assume they don't want care. But it's also different from, uh, from actual professional judgment that, that could consider a wide range of considerations rather than just what's in the rules. My objection is to the idea that rationing is what we aren't doing and have to do to control costs. but. Uh, Professor Silvers and Professor Binstock. 
Comments? I, I think, um, Max, you, you made it provocative the way you stated it, which is good for discussion, but I think it's misleading. Professional decision making is professional decision making. We all make marginal decisions. That's just the way people make decisions. So, uh, and in this case, I hire an intelligent agent to make some trade offs for me. The problem is when they don't do it well. Okay, again, take your point. Um, I had at Qualchoice. Okay. Yeah, I had a. Um, I was there probably a month, maybe a CEO, and I had a case. Uh, the, the plain deal. I had a big head, headline about bone marrow transplants. Lady denied bone marrow transplants by Aetna, I think. And I thought, oh my God, what's going on? I wonder if we've done that. So I went to the medical director. And I said, Todd, tell me every place we've ever denied bone marrow transplants. I want to know everything. What what's happened? He went back and he dug around. We hadn't denied one, not one, not one bone marrow transplant. I said, how could that be? He said, well, we always refer to university hospitals, and they make the decision. If they decide professionally it's the right thing to do, we do it. We pay for it. If they don't, we don't, and we never have any complaints. I thought, well, that's sort of interesting. You know, that, that, that says something about the way that professional decision. There was another one, and I will, I will uh, the fellow's not here, so I will not use his name, but he was the, med he was the, um, the director of a large bank that has a pointy top on it downtown in Cleveland. And <laughs> I won't name the bank. And, and I never forget having lunch with the guy once. He says, well, we don't want to cover this. And I forget what this was, but it was some treatment. He says, look, we want to exclude that. But don't you ever tell our employees we made that decision. And I thought, you unethical son of a gun. That is wrong. So I want to go back and change the name from Call Choice Health Plan to Scapegoat Health Plan because I figured that's what we're that's what we're in the business. We're the bad guy. Okay. So I accept it and beat me up politically. It's okay. I think I think that kind of thing, getting rid of pre-existing conditions, doing guaranteed insurability is obvious. It's a correction that takes away that bad decision making process by that agent and levels the playing field, makes everything equal, all the players are the same. That's making the agency work the way it should work, and that's entirely appropriate, and I think that's part of the regulatory process we ought to have. But we're still going to have it. Your point's well taken. It's always going to be there. We're always making decisions. It's just how we, you got to go teach a class. Okay. <laughs> so I would just uh, confess that I have been a rationer. Uh, I had my mother's power of attorney, health care durable power of attorney. And uh, she had Alzheimer's for many years and ended up in the nursing home. And uh, she had uh, some rectal bleeding and was transferred to the hospital. And they gave her three pints of blood. And then it happened the second time. And I said to the doctor, so can't we, you know, what's causing this? Can't we do something about it? And he said, well, we could do a GI workup. And if we found something, it would undoubtedly require surgery. Your mother is now 97. Uh, I don't think she'll live through the surgery. So I cut off that test. And then just before she died, he called me and said, your mother is failing. This was at the age of 100. Uh, and I could send her to the hospital across the parking lot from the nursing home or I could do everything I can for her here in the nursing home. And I opted for the latter. So I'm a confessed rationer, and I think, you know, part of what we need is um, more doctors like that. That's my opinion. Sir. Uh, yes, I had a couple quick comments for uh, Dr. Silvis. Um, you mentioned something um, in your speech. You said that we should figure out who are the best providers and funnel resources towards them, essentially. And uh, my question funnel is... Funnel patients towards them. Funnel patients, okay. Funnel business towards them. Uh, how is that not going to be politicized? I mean, if you have a, the government running this, how, how do you expect for it not to be influenced by special interests? And why is it not a better idea to leave it up to consumers uh, to decide which care works best for them? Because as, as uh, Hayek told us in um, The Use of Knowledge in Society, the government does not have perfect knowledge, which is why central planning does not work. Because when you when that happens, you inevitably have a government bias, and there's going to be lobbyists that 
that are going to influence that decision. So why is it that you think it's better for the government, who is, uh, when it becomes so large, easily corruptible, uh, a better decision maker than the individual who knows more about their problems, their financial situation, who can make then therefore make a voluntary uh, transaction with uh, an insurance business? I love economic students. This is great. Now, political science, actually. <laughs> oh, political. Oh, well, you had an econ class someplace along. I the. Um, one, you misunderstood me. I wasn't talking about the government doing it. I'm talking about private business doing it. Because that's what PPOs are all about. PPOs yeah. have contracted with networks of hospitals on the basis of, and doctors on the basis of price discounts. They're going to keep doing that. I'd rather have them do it not just on price but also on outcome and quality. And then we will, we will channel, f fun, uh, ch channel more people to high-quality, efficient providers that with high volumes will be less likely to do excess utilization and all the other sorts of so things. How would you plan to do that without utilizing force? If you, 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 you oh, I write a contract. It's real easy. I get my law school people to help me write contracts. Well, and but I say, can't they already do that, though? No. I mean, how would that be any different than what no, we they, have? They, well, they, they already have networks they can go to, and I can, I can go to one place. Qualtrics was a network around university hospitals, so my people couldn't go to Cleveland Clinic. But there's a, there's a, there's a series of distinctions to be made here, okay? Uh, Professor Silvers is saying that he wants the purchasers, the agents, to choose among higher quality providers. Now, that's still not the individual right. who isn't the individual insured choosing, but it's certainly not the government choosing. And it's the basic idea, uh, and, and what some economists would say is that y you then as an individual should choose among the insurers based on some measure of their performance. Um, the Medicare data is not the government saying what anybody should do. It's just an attempt to come up with data that individuals and actually insurance companies, if they wished, could use to judge the quality of various providers. And so there's, there's two theoretical problems. You, know, there's, you can talk about the issue of uh, is there sufficient you know, of the government being biased as opposed to individuals not being biased, but there's a more fundamental problem than that, which is do you have good information? And where do you get the information? And, you know, what has been happening is there have been a lot of proposals for the government to provide information, and the government isn't really very biased in providing the information as far as anybody can tell. I mean, there you've got serious, I mean, it doesn't matter to the government which ones come out, which hospitals are higher quality, which hospitals are lower quality. Um, there, is, there really doesn't appear to be much bias in those studies, but whenever a given hospital doesn't come out where it wants to come out, such as the Cleveland Clinic, which has apparently, according to this data, horrendous readmission rates, um, then they claim the government is biased. And so one of the problems politically is that whenever you do studies trying to determine quality, whoever does them, I mean, the fact is that when the, there was a coalition of Cleveland businesses doing studies of quality and so on, and the clinic wasn't coming out as well as the clinic wanted to come out, it said those, that data was bad. Um, and, so, and so there's a big problem with all of this in getting the data to actually have informed choice, whether the government or corporations or individuals are to choose. I, I can agree with that. And, but I, I guess sort of to, for, for clarification purposes, uh, exactly what are you proposing then? Like, so you would have a law that would mandate no, that every, no, no, every no, you're missing a provider point. has to let its no, no, I'm, uh, I'm agreeing with you choose. about the government. The role of the government is it, it gets co-opted and right. there are big problems. And every time the government's tried to direct traffic, they get in trouble. So right. we're probably going to have to fall back. I'm not disagreeing with some of the pu public policy arguments right. over here about payment. And there will be payments, pay for performance, incentives, bundling. Th those are all perfectly okay. Okay. That's not going to affect the malign share of the people that are out there. The so what you're proposing people, would not be a law then. It's just like a suggestion to it's, the – It's already there. All you have to do okay. is do it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we have to inform it. My bottom line is we will always have a market dominated by agents. Right. Medical agents are always going to be there because it's too complicated a project. And physical agents will always be there because it's very complicated and there's some insurance issues and financing across time and, and things yeah. of that sort. So would you be against uh, forcing employers to provide insurance for their employees? I think that's perfectly acceptable public policy if you want to do that. To it do puts that. everybody in the pool, levels things out. I think that's a and, – and it, particularly if you're going to mandate 
uh, no pre-existing conditions and things of that sort. You really do have to have a broad pool. Okay. Well, just, just one more comment, then I'll step down. I mean, my, my parents own a small business, and I, I can tell you firsthand, they would have to shut down if they had to provide insurance for all their employees. And they pay them quite well, and they all have private insurance because they can afford it because of their salaries. But in order to mandate that, you know, we've done the math, and they would, they would have to. Look at yeah. the details of the bill. The subsidies yeah. are, are built in to take yeah, you, care you, of You would really need to look at the details of the bill, and, uh, and there are a lot of different ways of doing it. It should be pointed out that lots of people manage to do it one way or the other. But that's a separate discussion. I'd like to give the other people a chance. Well, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd be glad to talk about it later if you'd like. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Dan Orn from medical school. I, I am a physician. I love deciding who lives and who dies. Um, joke. <laughs> you have to tell people that. I know, I know. Um, first of all, I think we've confused a little bit rationing versus access. And I, I, I really just throw that out, that um, ra ra they're very different. And when we talk about how certain um, members of society um, appear to be uh, receiving rationing, really, I, I, th I think it's an access issue. And, and, and uh, clearly there are differences in how we deliver care to different populations, and it has nothing to, I don't believe it ha really has anything to do with rationing. It's something we have to fix, um, but it's not rationing. Uh, I think you hit the point that's w one of my biggest concerns about um, where we are in, in, in medicine is a lack of uh, knowledge, not being able to determine easily which what care is better than another. And, and as long as we have that problem, we're, we're not going to be able to make uh, some careful decisions about um, how we move forward and provide, provide care. So I think we need to invest much more money um, in this process of choosing and figuring out what care is, is, is better than another. And, and, and uh, there is some money being put forward for that, but I don't think it's going to be enough. Uh, what Dr. Ornt has done is he's pointed to a, a distinction that's really important here and that we're trying to make. Uh, on the one hand, there are these people, ethicists, economists, largely, and then people who just listen to them, who say that the real reason we have high costs is we're providing a lot of unnecessary care to people at the end of life, and we have to learn to ration and make tough choices and so on. On the other hand, there's a legitimate, much more legitimate argument that there are lots of situations where we don't know what the right care is, and that there is a presumption, may or may not be true, that you would save money if you figured out what the right care is and that therefore we should do a lot more research to try to figure out what the right care is more generally. Still have to apply it to individual cases, which is a problem. The question then becomes, how, do you, how would you make this work? And the answer is, once you came up with that information, well, there'd have to be some sort of standards or guidelines written communicating to people what the knowledge is. And okay, um, there's two ways that could work. Doctors could all just sort of know it, or they could be published somewhere, and, and maybe even there'd be some oversight of whether doctors are following the guidelines or not. And as soon as you turn from there being research to there being some sort of the impl implementation of the research, you have the idea that there is somebody other than your doctor influencing the decisions your doctor is making about your care. And that looks to the average citizen like rationing. Rationing is to the average citizen what my doctor wants to do for me, somebody else says she shouldn't. And that's why the issue, that's why when I spoke to some people in Cincinnati back in February, they looked at the stuff in the stimulus, stimulus bill to do research as, well, this is going to lead to rationing. Okay? So there is a problem here because rationing at one level is a statement of politics, uh, of, of power and authority. Who has authority over my care? My physician, who is, by the way, a very flawed agent in some cases, or somebody else. Anybody else want to comment on this? <laughs> well, that's more than enough. Uh, Scott. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, Scott Frank. I'm a family physician and public health uh, practitioner. Let me get this straight. If tests are ineffective, unproven, uh, unnecessary, I'm not supposed to do them? 
I generally don't think you should. To me, this is really the issue. Uh, uh, health reform is talking about trying to make medicine make more sense and to do the things that uh, uh, are effective uh, and uh, uh, not the things that are ineffective. Um, one of the dilemmas that we have, um, uh, coming back to um, JB's uh, comments about um, sending uh, patients to the best provider and combining those with Joe's comments on clinical practice guidelines, those exist now. Clinical practice guidelines exist and the research that's done on those pr clinical practice guidelines almost universally shows substantially less than 50% um, of those clinical guidelines being met. So the translation of this research into practice uh, is an ongoing problem uh, that may take a new generation of uh, physicians uh, who are taught from the beginning to uh, take a more evidence-based approach before uh, we'll see a change. Um, uh, so to me, health reform is a big problem for people who like uh, doing unnecessary, unproven uh, uh, tests uh, more than it is uh, for people, uh, for the, the overall health of our uh, population or individuals within the population. Let me respond. Got, Scott, that's helpful, I think. The, <clears throat> I would argue, again, if you, tre if you look at everything the way it is right now and say, how are we going to do this, you've got a real problem. What, what the whole impetus here is to change both the supply and demand side. So you want to change people the way they purchase. That, that's sort of what I was talking about. You also want to change the way people supply it. Already in the last few years that the Medicare Compare has been out, you will find the indicators that are out there, uh, having aspirin delivered within an hour of presenting with heart attack, uh, pneumococcal vaccinations, a whole bunch of other things. Those numbers that start out pretty bad get very rapidly better, okay, by public exposure. Nobody want, then no money involved, nothing wants to have happen. Some of them are underuse. There's clearly a problem of underuse, no question about that. So it's, it's wrong to talk about rationing because many times we just don't do the right thing. It has major consequences. And there's a big problem of overuse, too. So I think that we're in the dilemma of trying to create, and it's not an individual. Usually when there's a failure, it's not one person. We tend to look at the malpractice tends to drive us that way, the training of individual docs. It's a system fails. So now the big challenge will be, I think, electronic medical records are not just ways to take pencil and paper and put it in a machine. They're ways to create problem-oriented records, to, do, to, do, to put flags in, to do intelligent processing. To, to mobilize all the other people on the team to make sure that we don't admit something doesn't fall between the cracks, that we, we follow the sort of obvious things and sometimes some not so obvious things. Frankly, I'm pretty optimistic about that. I think in the next five years we're going to see some really interesting changes around quality that also then I think has ramifications for cost because we're not going to make as many mistakes and have as many follow-ups. If we just got rid of, if we moved that 25% readmission rate, down by 5 or 10 percent, which it should be easy to do just by paying attention to discharge uh, and follow up and, you know, integration of care. That's a huge cost saver right there. That will happen. The payment system will encourage it. The information will encourage it. And I think we'll find people on the, on the provider side to be incredibly responsive to some of these things without bludgeoning them. You know, so I'm, pr I'm pretty, I'm, that's my optimistic side. So. Uh, I would just follow up by uh, saying that I share your optimism about the manner in which electronic health records can transform uh, medicine um, uh, because uh, it not only uh, will uh, help guide physicians with uh, this um, uh, uh, careful processing of the, uh, of the guidelines and information uh, based on their own experience and, and knowledge, but it also gives us an opportunity to study what is effective and what isn't without spending a lot of extra money because the process of care can be examined in much greater detail when electronic health uh, records are, are available. Uh, my last uh, comment uh, will be that uh, the other problem with choosing just the best physicians is that there really aren't enough of the right kind of physicians available already. Uh, only so the ones if, that come from our medical school, those are the only ones that are <laughs> 
Uh, there are not enough primary care physicians uh, in, in our population to care for the influx of patients uh, that uh, uh, is uh, going to come uh, in one way or another. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it um, puts a dent in the, in the approach of sending only to the best when somebody is going to have to be going to those physicians who are less effective uh, uh, than those who are most effective. I naturally have lots of comments on all of this, but I should defer, except to point out that you can't have a system where people only go to the best, unless you've got a whole lot more suppliers than you want to have in the first place. And when people end up going to what they've heard is the worst, or not the best, that doesn't necessarily go over all that well. And actually what happens is they end up telling themselves these people are the best, because people don't want to believe that they're going to a doctor who isn't very good. And they will try to resist believing that. Sir. Hi, Daniel Tisch from Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Um, I, I find this debate very confusing in that there are a number of analogies that are inappropriate, some very heartwarming stories, some very scary stories that we hear that don't really truly represent the issues that we're discussing. So I, I'm, I'm honestly very confused about rationing still. I've heard two panelists today describe their personal experiences with rationing. But in both those cases, they seem quite contrary, contrary to rationing in that the physician approached the patient, or in, this patient, or in this case, the patient's representatives of families, and asked them what should be done. The, the patients and their families had a choice. There was no concept of there's limited resources, there's limited time, there's, there's limited money. Um, it was always the patient's choice, or the family's choice in this case. And that, that, does, that doesn't seem to me to be rationing if, it, if you're asking the individual to use less or if it's not even about the quantity of available resources, but what's best for the patient. Well, that's because we were responding to Max's example. Uh, and, and, I, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that that, uh, that is, those cases are not rationing in the way that um, Dan Callahan or Dan Brock or Peter Singer are recommending rationing, or in the ways that the people who then take, take off from that work and say, uh, we're failing to confront the need to ration. Uh, are, are, are using the term. So, um, you know, I got an article here. End of life issues need to be addressed. In all the discussion of health care reform, there is one issue that has received short shrift but has the potential to save billions of dollars in untold suffering if it is effectively addressed. I'm talking about futile treatments at or near the end of life. This is New York Times, August 18th. And so. Um, Can I respond to Dan? Because yeah, so. he characterized. Uh, what I said and maybe what you said, I think you mischaracterized it. I think what the physician was suggesting was what would be best for the patient. So in the case of, you know, if we did this, there would be an operation and she'd probably die and it'll be okay to give her the three pints of blood periodically. He was suggesting that would be best for the patient. He wasn't suggesting uh, scarce resources uh, or, you know, and in the other case, uh, I know perfectly well that every time my mother went to the hospital, she got incredibly disoriented, even when she was only slightly uh, stricken with Alzheimer's. Okay, So in both cases, I thought this is best. He's advising this is best for the patient. And so I said, sounds like good advice to me. But there's one thing these stories do tell, is that there's this sort of assumption uh, that that is in the literature that there is just this incredible excess of care for people, especially as they get older and older, and that, that, and that um, people don't make these choices through the natural course of how the system works. And the fact is that, as these examples show, people do. This is not a system which you know, just keeps putting people on tubes and putting people on tubes and nobody thinks about it or anything. In fact, you would get the impression from some of the discussions that as people get older and older, they just get more and more medical care and it gets more expensive for them to die. No, you hit the early 80s, and from the early 80s on, the cost of care at the end of life goes down. And that suggests that there are actually some informal practices going on, plus more of the people at the end of life just, you know, as you get older, just sort of die in their beds. But this, both are going on. There are differences in treatment patterns as people get older. So, you know, th there's a lot of misrepresentation of the facts in the arguments that we need to ration to save money. And I think that's what most, most bothers me. Dr. Yomtovia. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Roslyn Yom Tovi, and I'm a physician, a VA quality scholar, and also an MPH student. And I just want to raise an alternate view or concept of rationing. I think most rationing is insidious. It's going on all the time. It's particularly directed as the elder, at the elderly, and I've seen that professionally in my role as a physician and uh, with family members, elderly family members whose care, I must tell you, and this is through many hospitals, so I'm not going to point a finger at any one, <laughs> was shocking. Things that were allowed to happen because, you know, my mother was 82 or something, and, you know, you notice something about her care. One example is her heart rate was 160. And I said to the nurse, why is my mother's heart rate 160? He said, she must be nervous. I said, my mother's never nervous. <laughs> on and on and on. Finally, you know, a cardiologist was called, da-da-da. Things were taken care of. But it made me think about elderly as victims, constant victims, by mainly yeah. younger doctors. Frankly, the house staff are young, youthful people who are taking care of more and more older people. And there's this gap between, I mean, they don't even think about it. It's subconscious. So that's my alternate concept of rationing, that it's a subconscious, subterranean thing. We're just going to add to the elderly the poor and the uninsured. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Scott. Right, Professor yes. Franks has had the poor and the uninsured. And, and uh, I guess the question is, does Professor Pinstock want to add anything to that comment? Amen. <laughs> Amen, okay. You know, but, but still, I wouldn't use the R word. I call that bad medicine, pure and simple. Yeah. There needs to be better training. Yeah, exactly. Right. But the oh. point is uh, that I think uh, it's uh, very functional that Roz is making is that uh, the people that look different than the people who are offering care yeah. are the ones who are most likely to receive the least resources uh, and uh, the resource use would uh, be the least appropriate for. That, that is true, although I'm not sure, for example, how the data came out on black physicians and, you know, and, uh, on race, race of physician and race of patient. Does anybody know how that data came out? Okay, it would be interesting to look at. But yes, in general. Uh, we have three more questions here which we'll, which we'll try to get in, so I'll shut up. Try to keep it short. Hi, I'm Andrea Sation. I'm a soon-to-be former MPH student. I'm an MD-PhD student in health service research. Um, and I had a question and a quick comment first. I was really pleased to comment to hear, especially towards the end, about this idea of improving quality in medicine rather than just looking at quantity. And uh, of course, evidence-based medicine is ever so appealing within our med schools right now and within our epibiostats department. Um, I do see the overall problem is not having enough outcome measurement and enough reporting whether the outcomes are good or poor. We just don't do it much. Some hospitals that have started doing it have been getting some good praise. Uh, we've bashed a lot on Cleveland Clinic for a while, so maybe I'll say positive. They have been doing some heart, uh, you know, looking at our cardio outcomes since the 90s, which has been nice and good and bad. They've been more of their, up there published. And I also wanted to comment that with regards to outcome measurements, it's not just a matter of being able to choose a good or bad, quote unquote, physician or facility. When you have publicly visible outcome measurements, you improve quality across the board because if you notice that your quality is mediocre and you want to, you know, somebody else's quality is better, you want to compete. It's a competitive market, so I do see it as an overall improvement and benefit for everyone to push for further outcome measurements. And on the same line, too, once you have outcome measurements, look at more cost outcome measurements and predictive modeling. So please give me your money for my future research. <laughs> um, and um, my second comment was actually uh, what I was hoping to hear a little bit about more in the speech, and I, you know, I know it wasn't the main topic, I know it was rationing of healthcare, but uh, I was hoping to just hear a few words um, more about how lawsuits and over-provision of care as a result of a law lawsuit system we have in this country ha contributes to costs, which is not such an issue in other places of the world, you know, frivolous or not and also on the idea of prevention and how we can push for more prevention, especially in primary medicine, and how we can compensate our physicians for preventive measurements, which would 
you know, do a huge part in decreasing cost of health care 20, 30 years down the road, and the job we're doing of that. Uh, Can I ask you a que question uh, on that? Uh, aside from some areas like stopping smoking and so on, uh, how is the literature on demonstrating that preventive measures have much impact? Well, I could answer that question myself, but having Dr. Frank. I, I mean, I know, next there, to me I know there's a lot of cheerleading result. about it, okay? But it's, you know, noncompliance is a per pervasive problem. Noncompliance with advice, noncompliance in taking medications, noncompliance in getting flu shots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm asking, you know, this, this is a whole thing we're going to solve a lot by having more prevention. Right. And I'm wondering, and I don't know the answer. How, how extensive and how hard is the uh, literature on this? The well, problem with looking at prevention in general, I think, as you know, practitioners in the room will agree with me, is that you're looking so far down the line and what the impact will be so far down the line. Of course, patient noncompliance is a problem in all areas of medicine. Uh, however, if you look at it cost versus benefit, if you can get, you know, one of your 10 obese patients to go from being obese to overweight, the question is, what is the cost that this is saving 20, 30 years down the line when you don't have to do a coronary bypass surgery, which well, is if, costing if you, you could, yeah. tens of thousands? And if you could get that amount, and depending on what the cost is of the preventive quote-unquote treatment, there have been fairly extensive analyses done of both the prevention issue and the malpractice issue. Um, the best guide to any of these issues would be to just look at Congressional Budget Office reports and then look at the things they cite. Um, on the whole, the case for saving money in the health care system from prevention is not very good. Uh, there, are, there are rare exceptions. In the short term. In uh, well, you know, in, at least within a 10-year budgetary window, okay? And who knows what happens further out. Um, but there was, there was a you know, big review article, I think, in the New England Journal in July, was it, of last year? But there have been a lot there, you know, and the same with the malpractice is that, um, you know, in the case of, you know, corporate interests and so on, they make it, and, and medical interests make a big deal about malpractice. The public health community makes a big deal about prevention. In general, the numbers aren't there. Maybe they should be, but they're not. Yes? No. Hi, I'm Sarah Sweeney. I'm a first-year medical student over at Case. Um, and one of my primary goals is to educate medical students and the public about the health care reform debate. Um, obviously, we, especially with regards to rationing, we need to move beyond this sort of polarized debate. And there have been certain terms that have been highly polarized, such as death panels. So my question to all of you um, is, you know, what language do we use to have a more constructive debate about health care rationing? Um, again, the death panel's term was very effective to sort of drum up support against health care reform, but what language do we use to talk about rationing in a constructive way? Because I'm having a hard time. The economic discussion today really helped me understand the issue. But when I go to talk to my neighbor, when I go to talk to my doctor who actually might not understand these issues, what, what words do I use? Well, I can tell you what Barney Frank used at a town hall when some woman talked about the Nazi death panels. He said, quote, what planet are you living on? <laughs> talking, talking with you is, would be like talking to my dining room table. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, there's, there's two issues. Can, can I no, there's, there's two ways can to I clarify there's two really ways to, quickly? Yeah. Actually, so I guess my point is that there was something that really drummed up emotional response in people sure. about the death panels. So how can we think of some other language that can drum up that same emotion on a more constructive way. So. Well, okay, so there's, there's three questions here, okay? One is what do you do about people who say death panels? And for that you give Bonnie Frank's response, <laughs> right. okay? The second uh, is what should we should do about talking about rationing as Dan Brock and Peter Singer and so on uh, define it? And the answer is we shouldn't because it's irrelevant and misleading and they've got their facts wrong. And so if somebody else brings it up, you say it's irrelevant, it's misleading, you've got your facts wrong. <laughs> Costs at the end of you know, costs at the end of life uh, in Medicare are not, are not a driver of increased Medicare costs. They're just not. We've known this for many years. Aging is not a main driver of health care costs. It's not. We've known this for many years. There's lots and lots of studies in the health economics literature about this. Now, if the question is, what is the emotional 
hot button arguments you can make to actually get people to endorse health care reform. If I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I, guess, I guess I come back to the agency question that what we know is That's that physicians button. have a really hard time making decisions sometimes. And they, they rely on, on, on uh, family members entirely appropriately. That's part of evidence-based medicine. But they can't process all the evidence that's out there in each individual case. So they need help doing that. They need comparative effectiveness studies to be able to test that because the drug companies aren't going to give you that stuff. You know, so we need, to, we need to move down the knowledge path, but we also need to move down the implementation path. So we need systems, the stuff we were talking about, Scott, to do the, the guides, the helps, all that. And me, as a patient, I want you to have everything you possibly can, Dr. Jones. I want you to have all the help you can get from the knowledge base that you can have out there, from the, from the, the, from the information that's, that's available to you on each patient, to the archived records, that, uh, the archived packs that, so you don't have to redo the image again, to uh, intelligent systems that are going to, to a system that's focused around you to help you make those decisions. It's, it takes a village to take care of the patient. You know, all the other people are involved. That's what I want them to say is we, we want to make healthcare more effective. And I think effective is the key word, not rationing. Rationing is absolutely a political word that has no, no parlance here at all. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. A fi Final and sure to be superb. Last um, but not question. least. My no name means. is Bernie Smith, and I'm in the community mental health. I was in the community mental health field. I helped write the legislation which established the community mental health boards, and I was the first director here in Cuyahoga County. And I'm writing a history about community mental health in Cuyahoga County right now. So as I listened to Obama last night, I couldn't help but think about the differences between the federal government and the state government. Because at the state level, we know there is rationing. We know that there are many people who are denied access to services who cannot even see providers because there isn't the budget money. And the state makes the determination, and we have to live within the budget. My concern then, as I listen to what's happening, and I'm in favor, obviously, of reform, is what's going to happen. Obama said we're not going to spend a dime on it. Well, okay, I wish, <laughs> but my concern is what's going to happen. I think one of the speakers, one of you, spoke about rationing, and the first choice was what? Mental disabled, mentally disabled. These are the mentally ill. These are the substance abusers. What's going to happen if our budget does run askew? Mm -hmm. And will the federal government, as they have in the past, put more money in, or will they begin to think in terms of who's needy, who's not needy? And the stigma, the discrimination against the mentally ill, I hope, will not occur. So far, I've not heard it at the federal level. I don't know if it's written in small letters someplace. Good, good. Because parity is the issue. Even though Ohio has now joined parity, it differs in definition from the federal definition of parity for mental illness. So that, again, people are not getting the services that they need. Comments? I agree. Uh, I, I, health is a huge problem. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a few things to point out here. One is that uh, there is one of the basic questions for any reform is what's in the benefit package. And that's always contentious, and there are bound to be fights about it. And as you try to do the reform with less money, then it's more likely that the benefit package will be narrower. The second thing to say is that there is a very strong political incentive not to define the benefit package. And so all of the bills so far haven't defined the benefit package at the level you're talking about. What they have said is that there'll be various, here are the things that'll be covered, but then the insurance that'll be subsidized will uh, cover some actuarial percentage of these benefits, and the insurance plans will work that out as to what's actually covered. Now, I think that's a bad way to do it, uh, but, uh, but there is the legislation is saying this is the stuff that's eligible to be covered, but what the actual plans cover is in, defined in actuarial terms, and who knows, because the last thing we want to do is be in the business of saying, okay? I think the third thing to remember is that um, 
the whole issue of how costs will be controlled has many possible answers. You could cut the benefits. Now, in general, the history of federal government programs, unlike some state government programs, uh, but particularly the history of Medicare, is that when they hit the point of needing to cut costs, they haven't been doing it on the benefit side. They've been doing it on the provider payment side. Can you expect that to happen down the road? No, you can't be sure, but I'd say that for various very strong political reasons, those are the odds down the road. That's less true, I think, in state governments, and it's less true in state government bureaucracies that are funded as, as just a whole bureau uh, than it is in Medicare, which is an entitlement, I think. But you know, nobody can be sure how this is going to play out down the road. Uh, what I can say, as a sort of final comment and point of the panel, is that in the co course of thinking about health care reform, health care reform is an ethical and moral issue. It is also a financial issue. Unfortunately, the two are linked. A very common argument says we can address the financial issues by denying care to people, by rationing, and that we have an ethical responsibility to deny care to categories of people uh, by rationing because we can't afford to use the money on them and that we can somehow make those decisions in an appropriate way and that, we, and that people who deny that are being essentially fiscally irresponsible and immoral. I think it is fair to say that none of our panelists today think that that argument is either factually or ethically correct, even though it is extremely common in Washington policy circles at the moment. And I would like to thank Professor J.B. Silvers, Professor Robert H. Binstock, and all of you for participating in the discussion. Thank you.